coming out tonight, and I appreciate your patience and the delay before we begin the talk. I just want to introduce myself, and then I'll introduce my speaker tonight. My name is Will Bess. I'm the museum manager at the Champaign County History Museum. Anna Selak, who was a volunteer for the museum over the spring semester earlier this year, has been conducting work for my predecessor, Connor Munson, to research Dottie Schroeder and her life, and has been contacting family members, doing independent research in the Champaign County archives, and looking and scouring through the internet to learn the story of the woman behind the baseball icon, Dorothy Schroeder. Uh, today, to give you a little bit of a brief introduction into Anna, Anna Grado graduated from Concordia University in Chicago in 2021 with her bachelor's in history with a minor in theology. For 13 years, she competed in track and field and was a Division III NCAA athlete during her time at Concordia. She attended the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and recently received her master's degree in library and information sciences in May of 2023. Right now, Anna is currently a local history librarian at the Lincoln Library at for the Sangamon Valley Collection in Springfield, Illinois. So now, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Anna C. Lack. So first, I just want to thank the Champaign County History Museum and the Brainerd Free Library for allowing me to present to you guys tonight. I get to talk about one of my favorite people, <laughs> Dottie Schroeder. <laughs> I think a lot of us know her as the famous shortstop Dottie. <laughs> well, I was talking to my parents not too long ago, and this research project was probably one of the most challenging projects I've ever done. Baseball history is a whole new territory for me. And I'm really glad that I took on this challenge because I just feel like I learn something new every day when I read books and find new articles about the All-American Girls Baseball League. So I'm really glad that I took this opportunity to do this. Now, I cannot speak for Dottie and I cannot speak for the Schroeder family. Tonight, it is my job to interpret Dottie's story the best way I can and to inform you that Champaign County had a remarkable woman that lived here. Besides being one of the first women to play professional baseball, just at the age of 15, 15 years old, Dottie Schroeder, she took a risk to try out for the league. And gosh, she became one of the best baseball players in the league. Now Dottie and so many of the players in the, in the league they paved a path for me and so many female athletes to succeed in our sports today. And Dottie and all these players, they would be so proud with how much we've accomplished so far. And there's still so much more that we need to do. Now, <laughs> I kind of want to show this picture first. So, when I first started volunteering at the Champaign County History Museum, this is the first picture that I saw that's right behind the desk. And like, you know, when you first walk into the museum, it's right behind the desk with other pictures. And when I first started volunteering, I was just doing some side research for the museum whenever I could. And one of my first conversations with the former manager before Will, uh, Connor, which he cannot come here tonight, but um, Connor, one of our first conversations was about Dottie Schroeder. And I was familiar with the name, I knew the name, but I did not realize that she was from Champaign County. I did not realize that. And you know, when I'm talking to Connor about her and he really didn't know much about her. And all we really knew was the movie, everyone knows it, A League of Their Own. There's no crying in baseball. <laughs> So, and you know, I asked Connor, I was like, well, can I write an article about her maybe? Like, I just want to do some more research and see what I can find. So he let me do that, and you know, I was, I looked online, I went to the archive, found a handful of articles about, or the archive here, um, found a handful of articles here about her, and at the museum, there wasn't really too much about her, and for me, looking or doing some research, you know, finding out that you know she was the only woman to play 12, 12 seasons, like all 12 seasons of the league, 
and her having all these records and also being recognized in the Hall of Fame, Baseball Hall of Fame, I was just shocked that there was nothing, barely anything about her here. And so I went back to Connor and I gave him what uh, I found, but I said, Connor, I can't write this article. There's still so much more that we can find. There's still so much more. So I did some digging on the internet, social media, of course, and I was able to connect with family members of the Schroeder family, and, or the Schroeder family, and also some friends of Dottie. And that really opened the doors for us to be able to learn more about her because I, no one at the museum knew that the Schroeder family was still in the area. So, and that was really exciting to know. But, um, but Dottie, though, she just was a remarkable woman. She was. And I forgot to mention, though, with this photo, they asked her, so in an ad, to wear a catcher's uniform. I think it's kind of funny because in the movie, you know, Dottie, she's in a catcher's uniform, but our Dottie here, she's actually a shortstop. So I thought that was really funny, though. So now let's talk a little bit about that here. So Dorothy Augusta Schroeder was born on April 11, 1928, in Sedoris, Illinois. Known famously for her pigtails, Dorothy was considered one of the most well-organized fielders in the league. Dottie was extremely talented, so, so much that the Chicago Cubs manager, Charlie Grimm, if she were a man, she'd be worth $50,000 to any major league club. And that's pretty amazing for someone back then to say about a woman. Now, after joining the league, Dorothy instantly became a standout player and a fan favorite throughout her entire baseball career. As stated by family members and teammates, Dottie was a genuine and faithful woman. They could not name one single person who did not like Dottie. She was well-liked amongst the whole league and her friends. And um, she was a joy to be around with her funny, dry sense of humor and her contagious smile. And I want you guys, when we go through this PowerPoint tonight, take a look at these photos. See her, like, look at her smile. Because I just see pure joy every time she's playing baseball. Now, she was tall and slim, attractive, sporting blonde pigtails, and was widely photographed and acknowledged to be the league's most graceful player and simply beautiful in motion. She had a good arm, too. <laughs> like most of her fellow ball players, she was driven and had a strong work ethic on and off the field. She loved staying active, playing and watching baseball, traveling and spending time with her family and friends, and she loved attending church. Now, if I were to rank some of the most important things in her life, it would start with, with her faith and love of God, number one, her family and friends, and then baseball. Now, I say this because she knew that her talents came, was a gift from God. From God. Now, I wasn't too familiar with Sedoris. It's a very small town. <laughs> but Sedoris is a small town about southwest Champaign. It's not too far from Tolano or Savoy, Illinois. I think one of the most important things to know about Sedoris is that it's the first town founded in Champaign County. In April 1824, Henry Sedoris settled in Sedoris Grove on the Kaskaskia River. Now, he was the first permanent settler in Champaign County. In 1835, he built one of the first frame houses in Champaign County, hauling the lumber from Covington, Indiana. Now, I've been to Sedoris a handful of times at this point, and it's known as a farming community, and at one point was known as a really well-known baseball town. Now, the Schroeder family. Now... <laughs> I think some of you recognize the photo, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But um, Schroeder, so Schroeder is like a German name. So the Sodoris community, there's definitely a lot of German families in Sodoris. And just based on what some of the research I've done, I can trace back to at least 1876 is how long Schroeders have been in Champaign County or in Sodoris, Illinois. But the Schroeder family, so Dottie's family, they, you know, Dottie and her siblings, they grew up on a farm. And, um, but they came from a farm in central Illinois. And here's a little quote from Dottie. I remember out on the farm, we didn't have a batter ball. We played imaginary ball out in the cow, 
pasture. You can imagine what we use for bases. <laughs> so Walter and Ida Schroeder, so these are Dorothy's parents. This is such a beautiful picture of them. But as I said, Daddy grew up on the farm, and Walter, Walter Sr., he was very, he was very athletic, and he also had a love for baseball. Um, based on some articles I read about him, he was a manager and a baseball player at one point for a semi-pro league. And so when he was a manager, he actually had access to baseball, baseball bats and gloves, so they didn't have to use cow anymore, so <laughs> I didn't want to say it, but I did. But um, before 1943, now Walter Schroeder, he was a postmaster of Sidoris, and I really, I wanted to make this note though, but he made $20 a week, and Dottie, when she started playing for the league, she was making $55 a week. So she was making more money than her father was. Yeah, I was making a lot more money. Now, Walter Jr., so Walter Jr., he, yeah, I, I found this photo in your book. So, Walter Jr., he is the oldest of the three siblings. Um, he was drafted at 18 years old to serve in the 99th Infantry Division during World War II. Um, he played three sports, track and field, softball, basketball, and he was a state champion on a relay team, so that was pretty exciting to find out. Because remember, the Schroeders, they were very athletic. So Don, Donald, this is Daddy's twin, and um, it seemed like they were always together, and I know they were very close with each other. And I know towards the end of their lives, they actually moved to Champaign, after their mother Ida died and bought a house together and lived there together for a while. But, um, but Don, you know, like the rest of his family, he was very athletic. Um, he even was part of the softball team. They had a softball team in Sidoris that won three years in a row. So like they were very good back in the day. But, um, but yeah, but I found these photos in yearbooks though. And I just love these photos though. It just, um, it's just nice to see them together. But that's just what I love about them. Now here's another quote here I, um, from Katie Hortzman. And I'll, I'll talk a little more about Katie Hortzman here soon. But she was um, a friend, a good friend of Dottie's. And she also played with Dottie in the league and after the league. So, but we'll talk a little more about her. But I really wanted to read this quote because, you know, Dottie, and I'm going to read it. So Dottie's mother was her closest friend and they supported each other to the smallest detail. Her love for her brothers, Don and Walt, was just as great as her love for her mother. The family was exceptionally close. And that really does say a lot, because they were very close, and they did love each other very, very much. Now, I wanted to go into a little church history here in, from, in Sidoris. So, um, St. Paul's Lutheran Church um, it had its beginning when a group of German immigrants from Pomerania laid their foundations for their homes and spiritual care in Sidoris. On May 11, 1875, the local Lutherans organized a congregation with the name Evangelical Lutheran St. Lu Paul's Congregation. And of those founders, though, I was kind of do doing a little digging, and I found an F. Schroeder. So that shows that the Schroeder family has been involved within the Lutheran Church for, since the beginning in Sidoris. So that definitely gave me a gave me a lot of information to go off of. But, um, so this is the, the second church that was built. This was built in 1905. Um, it is not here anymore, a fire. Um, it was destroyed by a fire, which is unfortunate. But, um, but yeah, but it was on Saturday, January 27th, 1945, that the church was destroyed by the fire. And the congregation, they were able to use the local gym to hold their services. And this lasted about five years. And the new church was dedicated in 1950, which the cost of the new church was about approximately $88,000. And all the furnishings, with the exception of the altar and lectern, they were saved. And they're actually in the church today. So I kind of just wanted to show the progress of this church being built, the newer church. So this was in 1948. 
Um, this was taken during the dedication ceremony in 1950. And uh, this is what it is today. Um, I do want to mention, though, um, I did visit the church um, during my spring semester. I connected with a, cousin, a distant cousin of Dottie's. And for me, it was just amazing to be able to go to the church that Dottie went to because, and I don't think I mentioned this, though, so I actually grew up in the Lutheran Church in Missouri Synod also. So I definitely know what Dottie experienced and what she you know, listened or what she saw in the church. And, um, but I, kinda, I wanted to briefly talk about the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod also. So the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod teaches a response to the love of the triune God, the Father, the creator of all that exists, Jesus Christ, the Son, and who became human to suffer and die for the sins of all human beings and to rise to life again the ultimate victory over death and Satan, and the Holy Spirit who creates faith through God's word and sacraments. The three persons of the Trinity are co-equal, co-eternal, and one God. Now the LCMS accepts and preaches Bible-based teachings of Martin Luther that inspired the Reformation of the Christian Church in the 16th century. The teachings of Luther and the Reformers can be summarized in three phrase phrases, Grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone. And for me to be at this church, I was able to take communion, and that meant a lot to me. Because within the LCMS church, we believe in closed communion, and for me to be a member of the LCMS, though, and to have communion at Dottie's church, that meant a lot to me. That really did. Now, I wanted to read this quote again from Katie Hortzman. Now, as I said, Katie was very close to Dottie. Now, Dottie's love of God and family and friends were just a pre was just as precious to her as baseball. She was very religious. Singing in the church choir was always something she looked forward to every Sunday. So you see why I put church as one of her top values. So that's why I really wanted to talk about this. Now, this is my favorite picture. You see her and Don again together. This is their confirmation picture. Um... So confirmation, I also had to go through confirmation classes. But this is a time when they get formal instruction, they learn more about the Bible, Luther's small catechism. And depending on the church and the pastor, because I know for me, I had to write an essay to express or to confess my faith to the congregation. And that's when I had my first communion. For Dottie and Don and their classmates, I don't know what exactly they went through. I know they went through classes. Um, probably during this time, they probably had to answer questions. It just really depended on what the pastor and the church wanted them to do. They probably more than likely talk, were speaking in German also. So, but yeah, that's something I would like to learn more about. But I have a verse here. Um, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, Philippians 4.13. Now, this is my confirmation verse. I was actually going to choose a verse that was I keep close to my heart. And I don't know Dottie's verse, though. But for me, though, every time I see this verse, even now since I know more about her, I think about her all the time with this verse because I'm sure this is something that she thought about all the time when she was playing baseball. So I also found a picture of her confirmation class. So I was pretty excited to find this. She's the only girl in this picture, so I'm sure you can point her out. <laughs> but yeah, but this was taken in 1942. So just about a year before she joined the um, American League. I also found a picture of her in the choir. So she loved singing. And this picture was actually taken in 1950, so when the new church was dedicated. So, so that was taken in 1950. So they sang during that sermon. Now, I also want to talk about Sidoris High School because Dottie and her brothers went here as kids. Now, this school actually began as a three-year high school in the late 1880s. Their mascot was the Pirates. Um, and students who completed three years, they would have to go to another high school to complete their fourth year. Remind you, this was a very small high school. But in the 1930s, though, Sedoris High School became a four-year high school by the, excuse me, by the 1940s. But they were known for the athletics, such as softball and basketball and track. 
And but sadly, in 1940, in the 1949 to 1950 school year, the school closed, and they consolidated with the Uni School District in Tolona, Illinois. So Dottie graduated in the class in 1946. Um, I this is her senior photo. I love this photo. I'm just going to say I might say. Oh, this whole night. She's a beautiful woman. She is a very beautiful woman. She was part of the Glee Club, so of course she's singing. She loves to sing. Now, also, look at her face, though, okay? Make sure you look at her face. She was in student council when she was in high school. She was one of the leaders in her class, of course. I know we're kind of like putting I spy dot here. <laughs> now, I thought this was an important one to point out. So she was part of the Girls Athletic Association. And I'm not for sure if anyone's very familiar with this organization, but this was introduced in the Sidoris in, in the fall of 1944. And really the object of this organization was to stimulate interest in girls' athletics and gymnastics to promote ideals of health. Because remember, there were no sports for women during this time in high schools. But of course, you know, Dottie being the leader, she, she is. She was the president of GAA. She was probably the most athletic person of them all in there. So, this photo, though, I was excited to find this photo. So, Dottie was actually, she played club softball before she joined the league. And I, for the longest time, I didn't know like what she did before the league, especially if she played club ball. But first she played for the 4-H fast pitch softball team. And I'll tell you guys, trying to find articles about baseball teams, especially 1800s, early 1900s, is very difficult because that's some amateur teams were not talked about enough at that time. But then also she played for the Illinois Commercial College team in Champaign. So, um, but yeah, but this is such a great photo though, and I was really excited to um, find this. And, um, but I had talked to a woman not too long ago, um, and she actually played with Dottie. But she couldn't tell me the name of the team, but that, this is why I was excited, because this showed that she actually played um, amateur baseball, or softball, excuse me. Now, I kind of want to go into a little baseball history with women. So, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the excuse me, Bassard College. So, Bassard, excuse me, Bassard College. So, sports provided an arena for men to demonstrate strength, courage, and skill. Masculine traits always, was always important to protecting women and children, which was the role in, the role in those days. Whenever girls or women just demonstrated any interest in sports, they were told that their actions were unfeminine. Unfeminine. So basically, women, they were only allowed to be spectators during these games. And there's also belief that you know, women's participation in sports, this would lead to feminine muscular development that would interfere with motherhood. Isn't that, <laughs> isn't that crazy? Yeah, isn't that crazy? <sighs> I still roll my eyes with that one. <laughs> so since baseball became popularized in the 1830s, women play, the women played baseball. But with the creation of organized teams and professional games, men began to masculize baseball and sports. So really, they couldn't have professional or organized teams. Women continued, though, to participate. And in 1868, excuse me, 1866, the newly formed Vassar College instituted the first two organized women's teams. Created in 1861, um, this school was one of the seven Ivy League equivalent schools for women that sprouted up in New York and New England in the 1860s. So I thought that was really interesting to learn about. And here's a photo of one of the teams and their dresses, of course. <laughs> and then also, I, I really wanted to talk about the Bloomer Girls, though, too. So at the start of the 20th century, the idea of women's baseball teams grew in many cities like Boston, New York, Baltimore, they created their own teams. The teams were formed as they adopted a change of uniform wearing loose pants that gathered at the knee, created by Amelia Bloomer, hence the name, you know, Bloomer Girls. Each team had at least one 
male player, and I was kind of shocked by that because I thought, oh, it's just all girls. But no, men actually played for the Bloomer teams. <laughs> These men, they actually wore wigs and were tagged to the name Topper <laughs> as a nod to their additional locks. <sighs> That's funny. Okay, Smokey Joe Wood won Topper. He actually got his um, start with the Kansas Bloomer girls, and he later played for the Boston Red Sox, so he became professional. But remember, he started with the Bloomer girls. <laughs> Roger Horns Hornsby, another pro ball player who got his start with Boston. Boston, so here, oh, next slide, excuse me. Started with the Boston girls, later played for the Chicago Cubs and St. Louis Cardinals. So there's some male players that did pretty well after playing with the Bloomer girls. Now, Bloomer girls also ranged in age, and I found this very shocking. So one of the youngest players, shortstop Edith Hewton, uh, Bobby's. She was only 10 years old when she was playing. Wow. 10 years old? Yeah. <laughs> I'm really sorry, but they were not getting paid. <laughs> but, um, excuse me. So another Bloomer girl, Jackie Mitchell, she was later signed to the Chattanooga Lookouts. She was 17, by the way. And they were a semi pro team. In 1931, she played an expedition game against the New York Yankees, so I bet you guys can guess who she played against. <laughs> Babe Ruth. She pitched to Babe, both Babe Ruth and Lou Gray. No other woman in history can say that or claim that. So that's pretty impressive. So you see why I want to talk about the Bloomer girls here. Here's the Boston team. <laughs> I was getting a little ahead of myself. But, um, but you see, there is a couple men in the front row, and you know they played with women. And I found that very surprising, especially with how men thought we could not play sports. You know, couldn't do any, anything. So I also kind of want to talk about softball, too, because softball was a very, very popular sport. Um, softball is a standardized, modified form of regulation baseball. So they actually first started playing softball indoors. Now, I, this was a really cool story, but Softball actually did not come from baseball, surprisingly. So there was a group of men, they were watching a football game in New York. I can't remember the teams though that they were watching. But they found a random boxing glove on the ground and they decided to make it into a ball. They found a stick and they started playing a game of softball. So that's how softball came to be. Never knew that until recently. But softball, though, like I said, was very popular. By 1942, 200,000 men and women softball teams existed in the United States. But you know, softball, though, was known as a women's sport and still is known as a women's sport. Now, when the war broke, um, several, several people were worried that you know, they, they couldn't play baseball anymore. Men were starting to get drafted, heading over to Europe. But President Franklin D. Roosevelt, he wrote a letter, and this is what he said. I honestly feel that it would be the best for the country to keep baseball going. There will be fewer people unemployed, and everybody will work longer hours and harder than ever before. And that means that they ought to have a chance for recreation and for taking their minds off their work even more than before. That really says a lot there. But one of the people that was very concerned also, and he also agreed with FDR, Philip K. Wrigley. We all know who Philip K. Wrigley is, okay? Yeah. So he also worried a great deal about the future of Major League Baseball during the wartime. Attendance at Cubs games was low, and he was very worried. But you know, I found this really interesting though, because Wrigley, he had been aware of women's interests in baseball for a long time. Throughout the 1930s, he actually declared every Friday would be a ladies' day at Chicago's Wrigley Field where the Cubs played. Women were given special tickets and prizes or sentenced to attend the Cubs games. So that was pretty awesome that he did that. But he was really determined, though, to create a league that would be a nonprofit organization supervised by trustees rather than a pro profit motivated team owners. And that's when he thought, well, this is women's time. This is the women's time to shine and to play ball. But he actually spent over $100,000 to start the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. 
and then another $100,000 to help with advertisements. So he was very, very involved. Now I wanted to highlight these objectives. So All American Girls Base Professional Baseball League. Now first, the first objective was to furnish additional means of health recreation to the public. Second was to encourage girls and women employed in the ward to work to get out and play softball themselves, thereby getting the exercise they need to carry on their jobs more efficiently. And third, to keep all workers better satisfied with the living community, which they are now working. Now, we talked about pay, Daddy was paid. So, Wrigley offered to pay players from $50 to up to $125 a week. That's a lot of money back then. <laughs> Plus expenses, far more than what they could earn at factory jobs. And for many players, the salary would enable them to support their families and save money. I know a few that, that saved money to go to college. And it was just beyond ordinary at that time. And it was amazing that they were able to do that. I feel like I've been jumping the gun though here, but I do want to mention though, the league was actually first called the All-American Girls Softball League. I did not realize this, but the league changed its name several times though. And the reason why they did that was because at the beginning, as I mentioned, softball was more women's sport, so they wanted them to play softball. But to bring more people, like the crowds, they wanted to focus more on baseball. And we'll talk a little more about the, how baseball rules changed over the years. But they changed the name so more people would know that these girls are actually playing baseball. But I do want to mention though also, um, by the time of the, you know, when the women were um, recognized at the Baseball Hall of Fame, they did go back to the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League that we have today. So and that was pretty great that they were able to do that. Oh, I'm jumping the gun again. Okay, so um, this was an amazing find. Um, I forgot to mention this though. Just during my t research though, we were, uh, we were actually able to connect with um, Dottie's three nieces, so Walter Sr.'s uh, three children. And um, we were, they have everything of Dottie's, which was amazing to see. And I think one of my favorite things, and this is something that I really, really wanted to see, was Dorothy's first contract. That's pretty amazing. You don't get to see that every day. <laughs> but in this contract, though, it does list the rules that the women have to follow. And it's hard to see on this one, but you see um, her father's signature on this. And you see Dottie's signature on this. And she was paid $55 the first season, of course. So it mentions that in this. But I do want to go back to talking about Walter uh, Sr., her father. So... Dottie's father, he wrote an article from the Chicago Tribune about tryouts for the All-American Girls Softball League. Recognizing uh, Dottie's talents, he encouraged Dottie to try out for the team. So he and Dottie, they took a bus and went down to St. Louis. Only at the age of 15, Dorothy became the league's youngest player after succeed, succeeding at tryouts held at Sportsman Park in St. Louis, Missouri in 1943. Around 60 girls tried out in St. Louis and Dottie was one of two one of two that were chosen to attend the final tryouts at Wrigley Field in Chicago, Illinois. That's amazing. By 1943, Wrigley, uh, Philip Wrigley scouts had called 280 girls from thousands who showed up for local tryouts. So that's how many people Dottie tried out against. Like, that's crazy. And these were, and these were able, were sent to Chicago for spring training. Dottie was one of the first of 60 players recruited for the All-American Girls Softball League in 1943 in its first year of operation. Now here's another quote from Dottie. When it came time for my mother to go home, I was homesick. So Dottie's mother took her to Wrigley Field for tryouts. So I'd never been away from home before. She said, well, I'll leave it up to you. You can come home, which will be all right, or you can, can't stay. But, and this is what Dottie said, but if I go home, she thought to herself, I can't play ball. So you have to think, though, a lot of these girls who tried out, not only were they from cities, but a lot of them were from rural areas. They had never left their farms. They never left the towns that they lived in. 
So they, they never, like for Dottie, for example, she probably never, has never been outside of Illinois. And just to remember though, she was 15, and to be out on her own like that, I know for me, when I was 15, I don't think I could have done that. Now you don't have to read all this. This is just, <laughs> I just wanted to show you guys this. So remember the contract we talked about? These women had to follow 15 rules. 15. This is all the, all these, all the rules. But I do want to highlight a few of them, though. So they always had to appear in feminine attire. So on the baseball field, they had to appear in feminine. But then after games, practices, they always had to wear dresses and makeup all the time, all the time. Um, they couldn't wear boyish bobs. As I said, lipstick was always on. Smoking or drinking was not allowed in public places. And also, they had to be very careful with their language. And everything, like their social engagement, so they had to be approved by chaperones. And baseball uniform skirts shall not be shorter than six inches. So here are examples of the uniform. In this photo, though, you actually see how the symbol's different. So it has the softball logo on there. So, and I really wanted to show you guys that. So, um, but this was basically a one-piece um, one short skirt tunic with, um, and the designer, though, and I thought this was interesting. His name was Otis Shepard, and he, you know, assisted Wrigley with other projects. But Wrigley's wife, Helen, and a Chicago softball player, Annie Harnett, were actually influential in designing these uniforms. Never knew that. And, um, but the uniform, though, these uniforms, they're actually modeled based off, like, figure skating, uh, hockey players, and tennis outfits. But, um... So feminine ball players, though. So the theme for the league was, you know, recreation for war workers, femininity, family entertainment. So they had to, these girls had to follow the rules because if they broke the rules, and I forgot to mention this, they would be fined five dollars. Like I said, that's a lot of money back in the day. They did not want to lose money. <laughs> And I, I wanted to show this because this is just awesome, though, that they have this. But this is actually Dottie's bronzed glove. She got it bronzed years ago. And her nieces actually have this. And based on what they've told me, they, um, this was actually a museum in Fort Wayne. And when the museum closed, they contacted one of them, and they were able to get this glove back. So that's pretty awesome. This, would, this patch would have been on Dottie. Dorothy's um, side on her arm here. So then this actually came from her uniform. So this is what all the players had to wear on their uniforms. And then also with whatever team they're playing, so Daddy, for example, played for the Fort Wayne Daisies, this Daisies patch would be on the front of the uniform. So that's what they had to wear for all their games. So we have to talk about charm school. <laughs> I really don't think the movie did charm school justice, <laughs> to be real honest. But Wrigley hired teachers from Helena Rubiston Beauty Organization to provide charm classes for the players. And you know, and they were they had to learn how to put makeup on. They were taught manners. They had to learn how to do their hair. And um, I have another quote from Dottie. They're going to teach me how to be graceful. I learned how to be graceful by playing out in the pasture, sidestepping all the cow pies. <laughs> <laughs> and when asked, she's like, well, we were charmed by the end of the week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's really funny, guys. <laughs> uh, but, um, but speaking, you know, we talk about chaperones, though. So Wrigley, he sent out recruits um, and he found all, these recruits found all these women to come together to try out. But then also he hired managers and chaperones. And the managers, they came from professional leagues. And one of those reasons why he asked professional uh, former baseball players was to attract more fans to the games. And, you know, they also knew a lot about baseball, so they were teaching these girls how to play baseball. And the chaperones, all of them were women, and they were like mother figures to these girls. They were. And, and, you know, they're nurses whenever I, they have got a strawberry. Has anyone heard of strawberry before? Remember the skirts? If you slid or stole a base, you would have a big bruise 
skin peeling off her leg, and that was called a strawberry. So they would have to help the girls with that. But here's another quote, and I'm so glad that I found this book, though, because Dottie did an interview with other players with the author Susan Johnson, and this is such an incredible book, though, because Dottie definitely goes into detail about her career and what she experienced in the league. But um, this is what she said, though. I was brought up to respect authority. Maybe you question it in your own mind occasionally, but you didn't say those in those days. You respected, you respected your elders because they were over you, and that was reflected in how you felt when you went in, out into the world. So she really did have a lot of respect for her chaperones and for her managers because she really did learn a lot from them. And I think being in the league, it really prepared her for the real world after the league ended. Now, rules of the game always changed. And originally, they started off with a 12-inch ball in 1943. So remember, they were playing softball. Mm -hmm. But each year, though, for example, the ball got smaller. And it got to a men's size ball by the end of the league. But then also, another thing too, originally they were not allowed to steal bases at all the first year in the league. But to attract more fans, the, uh, the organization, they wanted to have the girls play, you know, be feminine, feminine, but also play like men. So they were trying to incorporate more of the men's rules in these games. So the bases, you know, they were really close together at one point, like in softball today, but they started to get further out, farther out. And close to like, I think it was at the end 75 feet, or 85 feet, excuse me, and today for men's baseball it's 90 feet from how far the bases are today. So, and, you know, Dottie, her being there all 12, in the league all 12 years, she had to learn new rules each year. <laughs> Now, there were 13 teams in the league. The first, um, they, were, they started off with four teams originally. Um, but the teams that I highlighted though, these are the teams that, the last teams that played in the league. Um, so, Wrigley, he eventually sold the league because his dream was for the women to play in major league fields. But a lot of the owners in these major league fields, they did not want them to play on these fields. So, you know, it was towards the end of the, excuse me, end of the war, Wrigley decided to sell uh, the league because, you know, he couldn't get what he wanted. But, um, but these teams though, you see though, like these teams were formed in different years though. So you see like the Chicago Collins and the Springfield Sallies, some of them only really lasted like a year. So I didn't realize that. So the South Bend Blue Sox, this is the first team that Dottie played for. Um, but here, again, I spy Dottie. <laughs> but um, I thought this was really cool just to learn about because the very first game of the week, Dottie and her team, South Bend, they actually played the first game against Rockford and they beat them. That was the first game when the league started. Oh, I'm getting excited. The first game <laughs> of the team that they played against. And so she was there day one, day one. And, but throughout these next couple of slides about the teams, uh, I'm gonna include some of her stats though, so you just see how she progressed as an athlete. But by 1944, she re reached a record high in stolen bases, but then she had a knee injury in that season. Um, one of the awesome things, though, just for these girls, though, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of them never traveled before. And Dottie, and I love this picture because she just looks so happy, but they took advantage of traveling in the cities. So, like, they were in South Bend, Indiana at this time, and they were able to ride their bikes, go to the movies, but they were celebrities in these towns. But yeah, they're celebrities in this town, in these towns, and especially Dottie. And so, but Dottie though, I mean, she was able to take advantage of just traveling and meeting new people and experiencing new things. And this, I think, this picture just kind of kind of shows though, just like how happy she is to be with people that share the same interests as her. Okay, Dottie was trained. Not good, not good. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having a little too much fun, guys, gosh. So Dottie was traded 
um, for Pinky. So she was a really good shortstop at the time. But Blue Sox, they sent their two youngest players, so Dottie was one of them. And they wanted Pauline Pinky Pyork, that's how you pronounce it, Pyork, because they thought that she was the better shortstop. Now during a game, I was reading this, this, this woman, Pinky, she actually spiked Dottie in the knee. So Dottie wasn't too happy with her, especially since she placed her. So that's not good. But really, that following year though, when Pinky, so her nickname Pinky, was playing for South Bend, she really didn't have a good season. She twisted her ankle. Um, she fielded um, .883. I mean, but Dottie, she had the, or excuse me, point. .754, but Dottie had a better field percentage though. So even the following year, but you know that's showing that Dottie's working. She's working. So this is just evidence. So so Dottie, <laughs> and you see in this picture, this was from a newspaper. She's yelling at the umpire. Um, but you see that her knees wrapped. And you know, talking to her nieces, she had a lot of knee problems the rest of her life after playing baseball, because you know she. She was like a vacuum cleaner. That's how you describe it as a shortstop. She was able to get those balls and throw them straight to the first, second, third base. But it really tore on her knees. And, you know, for her pinky to spike her in the knee with um, shoes, that wouldn't help. But, I mean, for the rest of her life, though, Dottie, you know, had knee problems. And she actually had knee surgery after one of the seasons playing for, um, uh, excuse me, Kenosha. So yeah, but she played for Kenosha. Um, looking at the stats here again, starting to improve a bit. She wasn't a great hitter. I mean, she was a better fielder, but you're starting to see though her batting average is starting to get a little better. And as I said, she's working. Next, Fort Wayne Daisies. I think a lot of people know Dottie for playing for Fort Wayne because she had such a successful career for Fort Wayne Daisies. She, out of all the four teams that she played for, she played for Fort Wayne the longest. And as you see here, batting average is starting to get better. And, but Fort Wayne though, she helped win a season regular title. She was named most valuable player. And in 1952, she was finally named all-star player. That's pretty impressive. And I do want to show this, though, because I was laughing about this at work, because at my current job, I work with a lot of local history documents. And for being in Springfield, the Springfield Sallies played in Springfield, Illinois. And we actually have pictures on file of the Springfield Sallies. But surprisingly, when I was going through the file, we actually had original photos of Dottie in there. I don't know why she was in there. So I did a little bit digging, and I came here to the archive here at Banner Free Library, and we actually have an article that talks about how Dottie Schroeder, you know, I feel like all these newspaper articles, whenever they win a game or when they talk about Dottie, it's, she's always the first person that they mention. How they basically swept them on their opening night. So these photos that we have at the Salmon Valley Collection, these were actually taken during that opening night game for the Springfield Sally's first ever game. So I was pretty excited to find those though. Ah, oh, Dottie was traded again. This is her third time. <laughs> so Dottie, again, she was not happy about this because you know she, like I said, was successful and she was an all-star player. But she was traded, Dottie was traded for Jean Havish, her pretty game grasshopper. <laughs> and as Havish, basically said in an interview, being traded Dottie is my only claim to fame. Because I think <laughs> she was shocked that she replaced the great Dottie Schroeder all-star player. But you know, Dottie will get her revenge very, very soon. <laughs> this quote though, I, I wanted to include this though because it really just showed how emotional she was when this happened. But I bawled my eyes out. I've been with Fort Wayne the longest time in my baseball career. At one time, at the time, you're crushed. I didn't want to leave my teammates, but all these things are for a purpose. I think it helped me make me a better player because you try a little a bit harder against the team that treated you. So she had fire inside of her. 
I know we're like getting excited, but come on, Dottie, let's do this. <laughs> so, Kalamazoo Lassies, you know, this is the last team that she played for in the league. And this by far was probably her best seasons ever. Um, I included the batting average in. Like I said, she wasn't a good batter, but seeing that she got 300s is pretty amazing. Because for any athlete, you know, or excuse me, any coach or manager, you want to see your athletes get better. You want to see them succeed. And for me, when I was in track and field, I was a thrower. So I threw shot put, this, this, hammer. And I was always competing against myself. But my coaches, they always wanted me to improve. And I always wanted to improve, especially my distance. So, but this really shows just like the dedication that she put in, into her career. But playing for these for the last season, she was an all-star again, nineteen fifty-three and nineteen fifty-four. Now I want to talk about promo <coughs> promotional ads and commercials. So these ads, commercials, they're featured in national periodicals such as Time, Life, Seventeen, Newsweek, and American Magazine. Like that's a big deal. And Wrigley's league founder believed in the value of advertising, which may, may have contributed to the league's extensive exposure and marketing focus. The league remained under Wrigley's advertising until 1951, and individual team directors took over the publicity. So um, I'm going to end this real quick because we're having issues with the video. But when I first met Dottie's nieces, they we were not for sure if there was a commercial ad with her in it. But I'm going to be real honest, after I met them, the next day I found a video of her. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to play this video. If you guys are interested in watching this video and hearing the audio, it's on YouTube. You can find it. But there's not going to be any audio on this. So you'll see Dottie here soon. There she is, <laughs> with her pigtails. See, she's smiling, but she's happy. So yeah, but that, you, that video is on YouTube, and if you guys are interested, you can look it up. Um, so let's get back to the PowerPoint here. <coughs> there we go. So Parade Magazine, I kind of want to talk about Parade Magazine. Everyone's familiar with Parade Magazine? Yeah. So Parade Magazine was an American nationwide Sunday newspaper magazine, distributed more than 700 newspapers nationwide until 2022. All their magazines are now, on, are e-magazines now. So you can find their magazines online. They're not printed anymore. And, but this was probably one of the most popular magazines though during the 1940s, 1950s. And I just pulled some examples, though. Like in this photo, you see Bing Crosby in a photo with a baseball player. You know, Taylor Swift, she's popular. She's on parade. You Betty White, Michelle Obama, Barack Obama. So you see all these celebrities now on Parade Magazine. Dottie is the front cover of Parade. She's the only woman from the league that was featured on the cover of Parade Magazine. Now here's what her teammate Katie Horstman had to say about Dottie here. Probably Dottie's greatest trait was her kindness. She was always nice to everyone, whether they were rich or poor. When people, people in the media talked about how great she was, Dottie would try to change the subject of the conversation. She was very, very humble. But um, I do want to mention though, I've been trying to find another copy of this magazine. I cannot find one, so this probably has to be the one and only cover right now that anyone knows of. So that's pretty exciting. Now, she was known as a smooth shortstop. And as I mentioned with newspapers, you know, they always talk about her in these games. She's a phenomenal player. And I kind of just want to highlight these two newspaper articles that I found. Um, she was a showgirl of the league. Her fishy and sparkly feel fielding has made this girl a standout wherever she performs. When Schroeder performs, since the timing all set, she'll provide the most beautiful performance. 
beautiful performance of Gracie Fielding that any fan would want to witness. That's very powerful there. And then also, Dyke Shore, the smooth and graceful shortstop of Fort Wayne Daisies, easily one of the most colorful players without a doubt. The most p- picturesque. Shorter is the ideal of the fans of the, of the American League. That really does say a lot in just two newspaper articles about Dottie. And there's just so many more. Now, Havana, Cuba. So I, I had no idea that they actually trained in another country during their sleep training. Mm-hmm. So their expedition training, they held that in Florida, Mississippi, and then in Cuba in 1947. But they had, the league had an experiment, though, because in 1947, the Brooklyn Dodgers actually went to Cuba also just to play against other teams. So the league decided to send their girls over to play in Cuba against some of the Cuban women's teams in baseball. And Jackie Robinson was actually down at the same time that he was. Yeah, so Jackie, Jackie was playing for the Dodgers in Cuba. Now, more than 55,000 Cuban baseball players showed up to watch the women. So during this, these expedition games, there were more fans in Cuba that went to the women's games than the men's games. And the men's teams, the major league teams, they lost a lot of money when they were down there. I, and that's amazing just to even think about because, you know, you have major league players. But during that time, though, a lot of these people in Cuba, they've never seen professional women, professional women athletes. So then for them, that, it was so exciting to see them play baseball. And you know, Dottie was there. Now, Dottie, she had a great time in Cuba. Like I said, she loved to travel. And being in another country was just amazing to her. But they were, as I said, though, like, in all these towns that they played for, they were like celebrities. And they were celebrities here in Cuba. They were even invited to the president's, as like a president's ball. And the president of Cuba at that time, his son, was trying to flirt with Dottie. <laughs> I don't think she was realizing what's happening. But all these men, though, in that party, though, were just gathering around her while she was just dancing and having a good time with her friends. <laughs> you know, she was beautiful, by the way. <laughs> so, I mentioned earlier how the league ended. Dottie actually continued after the league ended in 1954. But you know, remember how I said she got her revenge? In 1954, she played against Fort Wayne Daisies for the championship, the playoff championship, and they won. So she got her revenge there. <laughs> but after the league, though, she played for Bill Arlington's All-American team, and he was a former baseball player and manager for the Cubs in 1945 through 1958. And in this photo, um, you see Dottie, and actually her teammate, Katie Hortzman, actually played for this team also. But she and Katie Hortzman, though, they actually first met in 1951 because they both played for Fort Wayne Daisies. And it's just amazing, though, that they played together in this All-American team, too, after the league disbanded. But this All-American team, though, they played against men for four years, and they attracted a lot of crowds, though. But in the last year, in 1958, they disbanded. There just wasn't enough fan base. And I read an art, or I read somewhere in a book, though, that you know, in an interview with Dottie, Dottie was actually asked to continue to play softball. And Dottie, the you know, didn't want to play anymore. And for me, I kind of found that shocking at first. But now, when I think about Dottie right now <coughs> as a whole, you know, she was going through knee pain the whole time. So. I don't think her knees could have t- took it another couple seasons. But then also, remember how I said the baseball rules changed? You know, for baseball to end for her was crushing. And for them to ask her to play softball, it's kind of like going backwards in time. Because, you know, that 12 year period, Dottie was there for since day one. And she had to, you know, follow these new rules each season and learn how to play baseball, like men do, did. And for her, I just feel like she felt like it was going, she was going backwards, and she didn't want to go back to the same rules that she had to follow. So I completely understand how she was feeling in that moment. But um, I do, and, you know, there's some quotes I took from Katie Hortzman. Hort- Katie Hortzman, she was also a phenomenal player. Like Dottie, she was about seven, she's about seven, eight years younger than Dottie. 
And she was raised in Ohio, so, you know, small town girl like Dottie. And she also was an all-star third baseman and a very good pitcher. But what I found very amazing, though, about Katie, though, you know, she joined the league in 1951, and Dottie, in an oral, she, I found an oral history interview of Katie. She mentions how Dottie was like an idol to her. She grew up watching her, or excuse me, she read newspaper articles about her all the time. And there's actually a newspaper article that mentions that Charlie, Charlie Grimm quote, about $55,000 paid like, uh, for the league. She actually cut out that article and the picture of Dottie in it and had it in a scrapbook and basically put it on the page where, you know, she would eventually, she knew that, you know, she would follow her dreams just like Dottie did. And, um, but here's just a little quote, though, but I put Dottie's picture right on the front and put it under it, my ambition. Not knowing I was only 14 then and I saw this picture in the paper. I cut it out and I always dreamt that hopefully I would meet her. And she did. And um, I'm, I really believe that this is the photo that she would have cut out or, um, at that time. And because um, this photo was everywhere. And around the time she found um, that newspaper with a quote, though, this picture was everywhere for advertising for the Fort Wayne Daisies. So um, but I really believe that this is the photo that um, Katie cut out. And Katie, you know, she's still alive. Uh, she is 88 years old. And, um, but, you know, she had a very successful career after baseball. Um, but she became, um, she actually lived with Dottie and her family in Sedoris after um, this All-American team ended. And I, some of her nieces actually, or excuse me, some of Dottie's nieces actually remember Katie and called her Aunt Katie. And, um, but during that time in Sedoris, Katie was looking for a job. And, um, but she actually joined a, she, was, she grew up Catholic, but she became a nun. And during that time as a nun, she actually got her bachelor, um, excuse me, her physical education degree and became a PE teacher later and a track coach. So that was pretty awesome that she was able to do that. So Dottie's accomplishments and the legacy, there's a lot you can, we could talk about. But she played the most games. She was an all-time leader in RBI all-time leader at bats, all-time leader in walks, ranked second in hits, third in home runs, three-time best fielding shortstop, three-time all-star player, voted most popular player a couple times, and also she is shown in the Baseball Hall of Fame in the Girls Professional Exhibit that was done in 1988. And you know, very few women are shown in that exhibit right now. And in Sedoris, Illinois, they actually have a sign for Dottie. So they, they recognize her and her legacy. And this is a trophy, one of her all-star trophies. But a league of their own, though. But Penny Marshall <coughs> had actually invited Dottie to try out for a cameo role. But Dottie, she just could not physically do it at the time. And I think, um, but then also, like, Dor Dottie, she said that she had never enjoyed anything so much in her life, you know, before playing for the release team. She never wanted to relive those days of playing ball. Because I think for her, as she got older, she just wanted to remember her younger self playing baseball. I want to, and this is a quote from Dottie, I want, to, I want people to remember you as I was, not as a has-been. So, um, but this movie though, um, so after the league disbanded though, it seemed like the history of the league just was lost. No one knew about it. But then when the women, the league was, um, when they made an exhibit in the Baseball Hall of Fame, people started to recognize the league more, more especially, especially Penny Marshall. And, um, but this league was a hit, though. And suddenly, the league started to become popular. All these women that played for the league, they started to get baseball cards themselves and they're signing them for little kids. <laughs> Even Dottie had baseball cards and started signing them. Now, Dottie in the movie, as I said, she's a catcher, but she's based off about 10 other Dotties. There's a lot of Dotties in the league. Dorothy was a popular name. But um, I really think, though, when you think about our Dottie and the Dottie in the movie, they are kind of similar. Because, you know, even though Dottie in the movie had a sister and Dottie didn't and she wasn't a catcher, when you, if you remember in the movie, at the beginning of the movie, 
movie, she was she didn't want to go to the exhibit. She just didn't think baseball, you know, anything of baseball anymore. She didn't think it was important. I think at one point in Dottie's life, she thought that too because no one would be able to play baseball again, or women would be able to play baseball again. So you kind of see that similarities there between the two. But in 1996, uh, Dottie, um, she passed away in 1996, um, brain aneurysm. And she and her twin brother, Don, they're actually buried together in Cross Cemetery Stores, right by Walter, their older brother, Walter Jr. And I've been out to the cemetery a couple times, though. But, um, but I guess, you know, the last thing I want to say, though, and, uh, you know, I really appreciate you guys coming out. This Dottie, though, for my current job right now, I meet with several different types of patrons, and they always come in with research questions about their family members. And you'd be shocked just with how they just don't know anything about their ancestors. And when I talk to people in the community here, and even throughout central Illinois, you're starting to see people, like, they do not know anything about the league anymore, it seems like. And then also, especially younger generations. But then also here in Champaign County, I just feel like barely anyone knows Dobby Schroeder anymore, it seems like. So I just really hope that we can continue her legacy and even learn more about her as a person and a ball player. And I thank you guys so much for coming out. It's been such a privilege, though, just to learn more about her. So thank you.
History Talk. It will be virtual on Zoom uh, on the third Thursday of December on the 21st. Uh, Ted Whitmer, who is a author and Lincoln historian, will be discussing Lincoln's travels uh, to the White House and his journeys from Champaign County. Otherwise, thank you all for having me.